Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Friday's Latin lesson. We are going to check these three sentences real quick, and then we have some historical and uh, mythological content to discuss after that. Uh, so hopefully these sentences went pretty well for you all. The ones I've looked at already look pretty good. So let's proceed through these. So, Tempora nostra noxus mala, vetia nostra magna. Uh, this one's not too bad. We don't have a ton of grammar going on in terms of we don't have any direct objects, no genitives, um, nothing to, to color code. Uh, we basically just have a subject being uh, described with what we call in a fancy way a predicate nominative. So tempora nostra is the subject. I don't always underline the subject, but since there's not much else going on in the sentence grammatically, I'll do it this time. So our times, tempora nostra. That is a neuter third declension nominative plural ending on tempora from tempus temporis. Uh, now, nunc, are, sunt, evil or bad or wicked. Um, and then vitia nostra, our crimes. So remember, vitia is not life. Everyone always thinks it's from vita vitae, life. But it's actually from vitium, vitii, crimes. I saw some people make that mistake, and it's totally understandable. Uh, they're so close to one another. My older kids still make that mistake sometimes. But if you see an, an I after the T, then it's not vita. Um, well, yeah, unless it's an ablative or dative plural. Uh, but it, yeah, it's from vitium, so it was plural nominative. So it's just, it's our, our second subject for the other side of the semicolon. Um, so our crimes, great. So what we're doing is using suit, the verb from the first part of the sentence. We're using it twice. You don't actually have to repeat it, though, because if someone said this in English and just said our times now are evil, our crimes, comma, great, you, you would know what they meant. Um, but technically, if you wanted to reuse the, the suit, the R, A-R-E, you could do that. So yeah, don't forget about uh, sum esse. There it is right there. Sum I am, S-U-R, estet is. Sum as we are, estes y'all are. Sunt, they are. This is that third person plural one, that last one right there, sunt. Because we have, a, we have a they. The times count as a they. The crimes count as a they, if you, if you will. Uh, as in a third plural um, nominative. Uh, all right, so good. Hopefully that one wasn't too bad. Quare soror mea exori tuae literas scribit. Okay, we have a little bit of new vocabulary. Uh, quare can be tricky in that sometimes it's just this conjunction therefore, kind of like igator. Uh, and then other times it's why. So how can you tell which one it is? Well, it, our editor has added a question mark at the end of this, which is something that the ancient Romans wouldn't have had. They would have just had, they would have been familiar enough to, to be able to discern. But if we see a question mark at the end, then this is probably going to be why, this quare, not therefore. So why, and then remember, questions can be tricky to get going in terms of you really need to understand everything that's going on with your verb to get a question started. So why is the subject verbing is the best way to do this? Because I see soror mea, which is underlined, that's going to be the subject. And then I go all the way to the end to see the verb scribe it, and that's a verb, it's present tense. So I, I am needing to use a helping verb is, and that is tricky. That's something we still have to get used to, is that when we have questions, we're always needing to bust out a helping verb like is, or are, or will, or was, or were, uh, before we actually translate the, the, the verb itself, which is, in this case, to write, to scribo, scribe up. So why is the subject verbing? Why is my sister writing? A direct object. So literos is accusative. That can be the thing that they're writing. Uh, and there's a couple of different ways we, we, we can do this, but I'll, I'll show you two different ones right now. Uh, so why is my sister writing a direct object to your indirect object? Exori to I is your wife. That's the indirect object. Writing a direct object to your wife or indirect object. Or you could also say, why is my sister writing your wife letters? As in, why is my sister writing an indirect object direct objects? Uh, this makes me remember our famous example of throwing Jimmy the ball, right? We're not throwing Jimmy, we're throwing a ball to Jimmy. But that's a perfectly reasonable way to say that in English, that you can verb an indirect object, a direct object. It's kind of confusing uh, to, to, to put it that way potentially, but um, yeah. So, so you can put the direct object first or second is what I'm basically trying to say. 
So I figure this could have been tricky in that maybe you didn't necessarily think of writing as taking an indirect object. Uh, we've mostly seen indirect objects when we use do dare, that we give a direct object to an indirect object. But yeah, when you're writing something like a, a letter, you're usually writing it to an indirect object. Remember, to is the big uh, preposition friend of indirect objects, though by throwing Jimmy the ball, you don't actually need to use to. If you take the direct object first, if you throw the ball to Jimmy, then you will have to use to. All right, number three, Tyrannus populum stultum a terra vestra duquet. So if I just take the very first word and the last word, that is going to be the tyrant will lead. Now, some people actually caught this, and that was really cool. But you might be thinking, why is it will lead? Isn't it, shouldn't, couldn't it just be the tyrant leads, maybe? But remember, duco ducera is one of our new third conjugation verbs. So the E in the ending actually means it's future tense. Uh, I've highlighted the ending from our example of Scribo Scribra. So do kit would be present tense, D-U-C-I-T, whereas E-T means it's future tense. So uh, yeah, um, will is our helping verb friend for the future tense. So the tyrant will lead a direct object, right? What is our direct object? Hmm, could it be populum stultum? The tyrant will lead foolish people. The, the, the direct object. And then a terra vestra, we have some new vocabulary there, at least from a, that is short for x, which is our new word for from. Okay, I know we've used day for from before, but this is kind of a different sort of from. There's actually a few froms in Latin, for better or for worse. But yeah, so from your land. Vestra is also an adjective, we don't see a ton, but it's just the plural of tua, as in tuas tua tua, meaning your. Okay. All right, hopefully those weren't too bad. We'll keep doing a little more of that in our last few weeks uh, before we look at, uh, at Chapter 10 just a bit and wrap things up for the year. All right, as promised, there is some historical mythological content to go over. I thought I would do something where maybe a couple times a week starting now, I will just talk about one really impressive temple or uh, building or like... Uh, uh, so something impressive that was built during the Greco-Roman times. And the first thing I want to talk about is the Temple of Artemis. So this was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Other ones we might talk about would be the Temple of uh, uh, Olympia that has a huge statue or had a huge statue of Zeus. But we'll start off with this thing. Um, let's see. So this was a temple to Artemis, so I'll jump back to the slide, but just to, to refresh you, Artemis is the Greek word for the Roman Diana, who is the twin sister to Apollo. They are both quite good at archery. She was worshipped all throughout the Mediterranean for centuries, and sometimes she is called Phoebe, whereas her brother is called Phoebus. And her weapon is the bow and the arrow. Her animals are stags and deer, and uh, she, she generally is a goddess of the hunt. Um, but sometimes she's associated with the moon as well. Um, so this temple is actually in Turkey, so it's not actually in Greece. If you look at that middle map uh, with the, the various different color-coded parts um, that look kind of like puzzle pieces, Greece is that green part right in the middle. I know it looks real small, but that's Greece. To the left of it, or to the west of it, is Italy, the, the red part. And then to the east of it, it doesn't get its own color, but that's Turkey. So I've zoomed up on Turkey at the, the, the upper right map, and that blue square is roughly where this Temple of Artemis was. So she's all the way on the uh, western side of Turkey. So yeah, we associate these gods with Greece and then later Italy and Rome, but all over the Mediterranean, which is that area you see in the map, uh, these gods would end up having followings and temples and all of that good stuff. This temple is no longer standing, but what you see in the upper left picture is a, um, uh, a kind of reconstruction of what it looked like. And we have an illustration at the bottom, to the bottom, uh, to lower left. So there's all kind of interesting things going on with this temple. Uh, one of them being the fact that towards the 6th century, so that's about 2,600 years ago, uh, Croesus was in charge of the, 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 the city that this temple was located in, which is uh, Ephesus. So you might have heard of Ephesians in the Bible, potentially. Uh, that's where this temple is. It's in Ephesus. The temple itself was built around the 10th century, 
meaning that it is about 3,000 years old. Isn't that crazy? So 3,000 years old, uh, this temple, um, or it built 3,000 years ago is a better way to say it since it's no longer standing. But 400 years or so into its existence, Croesus, who was supposed to be the richest king in all of the Mediterranean, was in charge up until he comes into conflict with the Persians. So uh, a couple hundred years after this is when we have King Xerxes going up against the Greek alliance of Athenians. And so the Persian that Croesus loses to is basically the grandfather of Xerxes' father. Uh, later, Ephesus and the temple becomes a Roman settlement. So, you know, hundreds of years after the Persians and Croesus, Rome takes over the whole Mediterranean, and so Ephesus becomes one of many Roman settlements. Rome often had uh, chunks of Turkey under their control. And up until this guy Mithridates, so that, that the statue of that guy right there with the lion's cow on his head, which is similar to, to Heracles a little bit, uh, Mithridates, he wanted to take uh, Ephesus back for the Persians. So all of the Roman citizens who were living in uh, Turkey at that time, who were living in Ephesus, living in and around the Temple of Artemis, uh, it was not great for them when Mithridates took over. Mithridates was a very successful warlord who really took uh, the eastern part of the Mediterranean by storm. Uh, later on, it, it, it kind of goes back and forth between being a Greek territory, thus a Greek temple, and a Persian territory, thus a Persian temple. Um, but eventually, this is where Ptolemy XII will, will call home. He is the father of Cleopatra, so he's actually driven out of Egypt uh, when Cleopatra is just a little baby, and, and he ends up in Ephesus in the Temple of Artemis. Uh, Mark Anthony, who was the top general of Julius Caesar, he also has a uh, kind of, he, this Ephesus place is a home base for him. And all the while, the Temple of, the Artemis, uh, Temple of Artemis is uh, the kind of crowning achievement of Ephesus, uh, just simply because it's one of the more impressive temples of the Mediterranean. It was supposed to be really big. We know that it was... Uh, and it's up there with things like the Parthenon and uh, the, the Temple of Olympia in terms of its impressiveness. Um, and this reminds me of something that's also kind of interesting related to Turkey. Uh, by the way, at the time it was not called Turkey. Uh, there was different, depending on who, who was in control of what, it would be called different things. But that's, that's the modern day term for that part of uh, the Mediterranean. But Sibylle is this other goddess in, who was very important in Turkey. And Sibylle, of, often called Magna Mater, just meaning Great Mother, uh, was sometimes equated with Demeter, who was uh, one of the sisters of Zeus. She is a goddess of agriculture. And the reason I bring her up is just for our last little episode before we're done for today, is this really interesting thing where around the 2nd century, Rome is fighting with Carthage, this African territory uh, if you see right there, that blue chunk, that's Carthage. And Carthage gave Rome a serious run for their money for over a century. There are three Punic Wars, is what we call them. That's the wars between Rome and Carthage. And during the second one, that was the most dangerous because we have this guy Hannibal Barca, uh, who literally got elephants to cross the Alps into the Italian peninsula. And he was in Italy for years and years wreaking havoc. During that time, Rome is so freaked out that they consult an oracle who is a person who uh, kind of guides uh, Romans by consulting these ancient books that they had called the Sibylline Texts. Um, and, and she said, oh, what you need to do is go to Turkey and you need to get this goddess and you need to bring her to Rome. She, she's not in Rome. We, we need to bring her. She's going to help us. And so they send some people to go to Turkey, and there's a specific temple that's a little different than the Temple of Artemis. And in that temple is the goddess Sibylle in the form of a meteoric rock. So there is no picture of this meteoric rock. I just found an example of what it probably kind of looked like. But for, for the people who worshipped this goddess Sibylle, she literally was embodied in this meteorite which is pretty crazy to think about, right? We don't have all the details, so who knows if anyone ever like actually saw this meteorite fall out of the sky and they were able to recover it, or maybe it like crashed near some town and they, they could find it. We don't know all of that, 
But they, they found this rock, they knew it was special, and to them, that was the embodiment of the goddess. And you see this a lot of times in uh, Greco-Roman, uh, the Greco-Roman world, is that gods would have, like, one important statue. And the statue was more important than we think. It wasn't just some representation of the, of the god. Sometimes it really was the god. And sometimes it's not a statue, sometimes it's, it's a chunk of meteoric rock. It's kind of crazy. So they bring this rock back to Rome. And they think, like, once we have Sibylle here in Rome, she's going to help us out. She's going to help us win. Uh, and it wasn't even just the Punic War that was making them stressed out. There was a famine at the time. They would see uh, there were some um, uh, bad omens or what they thought were bad omens, like uh, like meteor showers, uh, which would, would have been something that people like oracles would have potentially said, oh, that's a bad sign, that's not good. Um, though, of course, it's it's kind of, you know, superstition. But they bring Magna Mater back to Rome. They build her a temple, which you see the ruins of to the upper left there. And then a little bit after this, Rome is actually able to defeat Carthage. Uh, is there a correlation? You know, probably not. But it did make Rome feel more confident to have this new goddess in Italy. Um Rome kind of liked collecting gods and goddesses. They'd go around to different territories, and if they could bring back a new god or goddess from some other place, they would do that. They would build that uh, new god or goddess a temple. It's pretty interesting. Uh, all right, we might talk a little more about some of those details, and uh, we're going to keep talking about some ancient and important sites for the Greco-Roman world. But for now, we'll be done, and I hope you all have a nice weekend, and I'll talk to you all on Monday. Thank you.